to do it. Uh, so I am, as Sammy said, a philosopher, um, but I am interested in neural networks. I'm not just interested in artificial neural networks, but in, originally my interest was in natural neural networks or us. Um, and the difficulty in being able to explain um, how we're able to do some of the things that we can do so well. One of the obvious things that we can do so well, um, and you know, it becomes more and more obvious the, the more that one uh, tries to create and fails to create models of, of this, is that we're brilliant at spotting high level features in our environment. So we're brilliant at spotting tables and bottles and birds and danger and that kind of thing. So uh, my interest in artificial neural networks comes from that interest in natural perception um, and in this beautiful model that we now appear to have of natural perception in uh, recently constructed deep artificial neural networks. So I've put in front of you uh, a picture of a very, very simple neural network. Uh, you can see on the left that we have some inputs and these uh, are passed through various nodes which are, have relations to uh, different layers of nodes and then we get an output at the end. And as many of you will know, being far more familiar with these systems than I am, this is ridiculously simplistic, this little model that I've put up in front of you. Uh, artificial neural networks, which are good at pattern spotting, which are good at the perceptual tasks that I'm interested in, have many more layers and far, far more nodes. But one thing we can say is that at the moment, at least, if we want really, really accurate and reliable and robust classification systems, we really have to use deep artificial neural networks. Nothing beats them for finding those high level features in the environment. And another thing which is relatively well known about deep artificial neural networks is that they're often described as being explanatorily opaque or uninterpretable, in one or another way, inexplicable. So those descriptions aren't just by people like me, um, who are lay people in the world of artificial intelligence. Uh, these descriptions can often be found in the mouths of people who themselves are designers creators and researchers of deep artificial neural networks. And that is what interests me, this explanatory opacity that seems to be uh, commonly accepted as being manifest by these brilliant high-level classifier machines. Machines that are a bit like us and how brilliant we are at classifying things. So, Here's just a little bit of uh, context. Um, one of the concerns is that while these machines are really brilliant, they're very robust and reliable and accurate in finding high level features, they are at the same time, according to their designers and others, explanatorily opaque. Okay? This is considered to be a pressing problem. So the Lord's report that came out very recently um, said that um, we really shouldn't be using deep neural networks at all. Um, or it may be, as the report puts it, that we really shouldn't be using deep neural networks at all, um, where uh, they're used, um, you know, for uh, sort of very important things and where we cannot give an explanation for the decisions that are made. So stakeholders, policymakers, regulators, and the public are, and understandably, deeply concerned that they don't have explanations for how these incredibly important and seemingly clever machines are working. Here's uh, Dennis Hassabis, right, hardly a layperson, the founder of Google DeepMind, says, 
and seems to accept this view that there is something explanatorily opaque when he says, look, we roughly know what's going on, but not specifically this bit of code is doing this. Like, this is why this happened on a particular occasion and so on. And he says for safety critical systems, you would want to know why a decision was made. So one reason uh, why it's very important to understand what is explanatorily opaque about deep artificial neural networks is precisely that it looks like a pressing problem for us. Right? We want this artificial accuracy. Um, it can be incredibly, it looks like it has the potential to be incredibly useful for us. But at the same time, if we don't understand it, we're worried about implementing it. But for me, there's a sort of deeper confusion here. There's a sort of weird puzzle with deep artificial neural networks because it's not actually clear exactly what we lack in terms of an explanation. Okay, if you think about it, right, this is, you know, meant to be the beauty of models in general, right? The beauty of a model is that you at least understand the model and how the model works, okay? And then the question is how well that model um, fits in with uh, um, reality and, you know, how well it makes predictions and so on. So my interest in deep artificial neural networks is that they can be a kind of model, right? albeit you know, very simplistic and different in some ways than, than natural neurons. Um, but it's puzzling then to hear their designers say that they don't understand how they work. Okay, if you think about it, right? The designers of these systems look like they have complete knowledge, godlike knowledge, both of their system's internal mathematical structure and indeed the mathematical processes that um, occur whenever the system is stimulated. They also have complete knowledge both of current stimulus and all previous stimulus for the systems that they operate with and design. They have full knowledge of the training data itself, all of the training algorithms, and indeed the design decisions in terms of um, what training algorithms to use and how to implement these training algorithms and so on. So it looks like there's just, just vast amounts of knowledge of these systems and how they work. And so it's puzzling in one sense, interestingly puzzling to hear the designers say that they don't understand them. Now, one thing you might say, remembering my comment that the, that the image that I put up of these systems was incredibly simplistic, is to say, well, look, these, these systems are just so complicated, right? There are so many nodes and so many hidden layers that it's really impossible for someone to have complete knowledge of it, even if the system itself is out there and is in one sense transparent to inspection. But I don't think that this in itself is the nub of the problem here. Okay? The, the complicatedness of the system is not the nub of the problem. Think about Saturn V, right? Saturn V had you know, millions and millions of parts, and I'm sure there are other examples which would be even better in this regard, okay? Millions and millions of parts, all put together, designed by thousands of different people, made in millions of different factories, out of different materials, interacting with each other in incredibly complex ways. But there's, there's no one person who has um, the knowledge of what went to putting this huge rocket together. Okay, but nonetheless, there's a sense in which we have complete knowledge of, uh, or at least something approaching complete knowledge, actually far less than complete knowledge we have of um, artificial neural networks. Uh, there's a sense in which we have knowledge of what's going on, right? It's all there for us uh, to find. And indeed, you know, you put us all together and you will find um, collectively that um, we do have the knowledge of how Saturn V worked, right? What what the systems were and how they worked. So even though an individual might not be able to get um, for themselves complete knowledge, everything is accessible to any individual and you put all the individuals together 
and you have something like complete knowledge. Now I say that in the case of artificial neural networks, we're actually a lot closer to having complete knowledge than we have of something like Saturn V, which we think that we do understand. And that's because, you know, no one knew exactly um, <clears throat> uh, where the, the crystals were aligned in all of the pieces of metal that were put together to create that rocket, right? So indeed our, our knowledge, we, our access to knowledge, the knowledge that we could access of Saturn V is far more limited <clears throat> than the knowledge an artificial neural network designer has of the system that they are interested in. So, you know, maybe I'm being slightly loose with the word knowledge here, right? This, it's all out there for us to find with artificial neural networks in a way that it wasn't for something incredibly complex, incredibly complex like Saturn V that we think we do understand. Right? We did understand how it worked, why it worked in the way that it did, and what it took to get it to work like that. So there's the puzzle. The puzzle is, in what sense could it possibly be that artificial neural networks are explanatory opaque, given that we have complete knowledge of their systems and their history and their inputs and everything else? It's interesting at this point explicitly to contrast and compare neuroscience as a project. Okay, so the neuroscientist, in comparison to the artificial neural network designer, has, has incredibly little knowledge. Um, their knowledge is highly incomplete, both of the neural structures, both of the processes that work over those neural structures, over the stimuli, current stimuli even, of, uh, of any system in action. But of course, you know, when you think about the training sets on, on uh, natural perception systems, right, these training sets go back presumably hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of years. Um, it's just not possible and not intelligible to, to conceive of oneself as having access to anything like a, a significant um, subset of the training set that these neurons were trained on. I mean, I know it's slightly different because these neurons just sort of start in a trained state, state okay, so there's an evolutionary algorithm at work, which is slightly different, but you, I hope you get my point. At the same time, you know, when you talk to neuroscientists, they're just utterly positive and optimistic, okay? So they say, look, not only do we already have lots of knowledge of how these neural systems work, in other words, they're very positive about where we are, but indeed, uh, you know, if we carry on doing what we're doing, uh, we can be optimistic that we will get to a place where we can fully understand, where we have genuine explanations of how these systems work. So there are the neuroscientists right, trying to collect the data that the artificial neural network um, designer just has out of the box. Um, and thinking that by collecting that data, they are in an optimistic position to be able to explain how minds work and how brains work. So that's odd, right? There's something odd going on. And what I want to do in the rest of the talk is just to say what I think that oddness is or what that oddness manifests. So what I thought it would be good to do to start with, I'm sort of taking uh, Russell's uh, view that uh, the the philosopher who wins is the philosopher who goes slowest. Okay, so I'm gonna make some very simple distinctions or at least some very background distinctions um, and reflections on the nature of explanation, which may seem really obvious to you. It'd be interesting to know whether these seem obvious to you, but I think have interesting implications for the puzzle that I've set up. And what I want to say is that at least in this case, it looks plausible that what we want from an explanation is a mechanism, and I'll say a little bit more about what mechanisms are. So the neuroscientist thinks that they are finding the mechanisms that underpin navigational behavior or um, perceptual capacities and so on. What I want to do then is 
to unpick two different um, focal points for our desire for explanation. Okay, so it turns out that explanations, however objective they are, are always going to be relative because they're relative to exactly what you want to know about, right? It's the classic um, uh, Douglas Adams uh, point, right? That you really need to know what your question is if you're going to understand the answer. And seeing that there are lots of different questions here to be answered, lots of questions in need of explanation, is gonna help us to understand and resolve the puzzle. And so hopefully this is gonna help me to clarify where I think the explanatory opacity comes in. And I'm going to make a pretty quick and loose case for saying that there is genuine explanatory opacity in um, sophisticated artificial neural networks. And then I'm gonna say some negative and pessimistic things to balance out the positive and optimistic things that neuroscientists are telling us and, and then I very much look forward to discussion. So let's think about explanation. And as I say, I'm just gonna take some, you know, very basic in one sense distinctions. So when we're thinking about explanation, we need to distinguish between the thing that we want to explain, the thing that we want to explain, in other words, the phenomenon or the explanandum, and the explanation that we're going to get for that thing. So you have a, a bridge collapsing, that's the phenomenon, that's what's going on out there in the world, and then you need to find some explanation for why the bridge has collapsed. And a distinction that I think is very useful among the different kinds of things that we might think are explanations for a bridge's collapse, for example, or for the workings of a deep neural network, is to think about the distinction between, on the one hand, things and processes, stuff going on out there in the world, and on the other hand, sentences, statements, and utterances. Now, it's very common to talk about explanations as if they are descriptions of the way the world is. I can describe the world and thereby provide you, give you, in my words, an explanation for why a particular phenomenon has occurred. But actually, it's also, um, when one phrases things slightly differently, very intuitive to think that explanations are, in fact, things themselves which are out there in the world. Right? Things and processes that are um, independent of our sentences and our statements and our utterances, at least in standard situations. Words make very little difference to the world. It's one of those sad truths. So why does this seem intuitive? Well, Think about uh, our perceptual capacities as humans. What explains these? Well, it's not going to be a sentence or a statement or an utterance which explains my ability to spot tables or to spot uh, danger in my environment. Right? What's going to explain that is going to be something that looks much more like a process or a structure out there in the world. Okay, so structures of neurons, um, evolutionary processes, perceptual processes, and so on. Right? Those are things which are just out there and nothing to do with what I say. So that view of what explanations are is what I'm going to call an ontic view, ontological, right? being out there in the world. And we can contrast that with what we might call an epistemic view of what explanations are. Okay, they're descriptions of or sentences relating to those things and processes which bump into each other out there in the real world and create the effects, the phenomena that we're interested in understanding. I want you to contrast that contrast, that distinction, with another distinction which we quite often draw when we're thinking about explanations or we quite often find ourselves hovering around, which is a distinction between the things which actually go on, which are responsible for the things we're interested in explaining, or the truths, true descriptions concerning those on the one hand, and on the other hand, those claims about the world which satisfy our desire for explanation. So, you know, sometimes uh, someone will try and explain something to me and it just 
doesn't satisfy me. They've said things. These things might be true. These things might even be uh, the causes of the phenomena that I'm interested in having explained. But for one or another reason, they don't satisfy me. Okay, so that, that view, so then it doesn't explain it to me, right, if, if that's the situation that we're in. And we quite often talk about explanation in that way. Quite often talk about explanations as being dependent on satisfying our audience. Right? It only explains it if it explains it to a particular audience. So I'm going to call explanations of the first kind, right, which, which include both ontic and epistemic understandings of explanation, objective explanations. Right? There's things out there in the world, truths, um, states of affairs, whatever it is, causal processes that um, are responsible for the phenomena that we're interested in explaining. And on the other hand, I'm going to call that sense of satisfaction that we sometimes get and sometimes fail to get um, a subjective understanding of explanation. It's just a matter of how the subject feels or responds to a particular claim. So now, with all of that in mind, uh, let's think about the other side of explanation. Okay, so we've thought about the explanants, we've thought about um, what kinds of things we mean to talk of when we talk of explanations, right? These are either, you know, sentences which satisfy or sentences which are true or aspects of the world um, which are out there and genuinely responsible for underpinning the phenomena that we're interested in. But I also say that it's important to understand what we're trying to explain and that all explanations are relative in the sense that they're relative to the phenomena that we're interested in. So take the example that I gave you before. We might be interested in trying to understand why the bridge collapsed. Okay, and there's going to be certain things which might be relevant to that, right? How, you know, what the crystalline structure was of the, of the metals, um, you know, what the calculations were as to how much load this would bear, how much resonance there would be um, in the structure and so on. You will notice that here's a different thing that we might want explained, right? We might want it explained not just why the bridge collapsed, but why it collapsed so quickly, right? There's sort of the slow rumbling collapse that one might imagine, and then there was this collapse, which was just so sudden and so catastrophic. And we might be interested in why it was so catastrophic. And for that, different aspects of the world or different truths about the world are going to be relevant. They're going to be responsible for that phenomenon or that aspect of the phenomenon that we're interested in. Right? We might need to know, you know why uh, one, uh, one breakage led to so many other breakages, right? why it had that knock-on effect and so on. That's, those questions are going to be relevant to this second phenomenon, the sudden collapse, in a way that they weren't perhaps going to be relevant to the first phenomenon, the collapse itself. And again, we might be interested in why the bridge collapsed so noisily. Next time I want my bridges to collapse less noisily, find out why this collapse was so noisy. And then we might start finding that things like, you know, the resonance properties of the materials um, are relevant in a way that they weren't relevant to the question of why the bridge collapsed. Here's a couple of other examples. So notice that all of those first questions are questions about a specific event that occurred. Okay, there was this particular bridge, and there was a particular collapse of that bridge, and it was sudden and noisy in those particular ways. So there was just a token or an individual event that we wanted some explanation for. But we might also want explanations for more general questions, right? Given some particular conditions, some wind speeds or some number of cars or people on the bridge, right, we might find that all bridges of a particular design collapse. And we might be interested in knowing more generally why bridges of this type, why bridges with this design collapse under those circumstances. Or again, we might think of uh, 
the kind and be interested in the contrast between the kind of bridge that this was and its collapse on this particular occasion. Okay, so it might be interesting to us and it might be something that's in need of explanation why given that all of these bridges were of the same basic design, only this bridge collapsed and the others didn't. So this is all a very long way of saying, look, you need to know what question you're asking if you're going to know what will satisfy uh, that question as an explanation. And one of the distinctions I've tried to bring out is that there is a distinction between trying to give an explanation for a kind of phenomenon bridges of this kind collapsing or failing to collapse in particular situations and trying to give explanations for specific individual events that happen. So why a particular bridge collapsed on a particular occasion. Okay, so when we're trying to explain why all bridges of this design collapse, we need to find things which are relevantly similar between the different individual bridges that we're interested in, which explain this shared property that they have of collapsing under conditions C. That's not something that we need to do when we're looking at individual events. Okay, so these are just some hopefully interesting, hopefully not too boring um, distinctions uh, that are useful when we're thinking about the nature of explanation and when we're asking uh, what kinds of explanations we should be looking for. And I want to suggest that it's very natural to think of explanations both as being ontic, so as being aspects of the world rather than descriptions of them or um, phenomenological responses to those descriptions, and subjective things. Um, and in that sense, I'm going to call a very plausible and standard view of explanation a mechanistic view. So specifically when we look at psychology and neuroscience, but also in lots of other fields and, and, and indeed just generally very intuitively, we tend to think of explanations as being, or at least aiming to be, trying to be mechanistic. Okay, what do I mean? Well, here's Ilari and Williamson. They say a mechanism for a phenomenon, so a mechanism for something we're trying to explain, consists of those entities and activities organized such that they are responsible for the phenomenon. Okay, so what we're looking for when we're trying to understand our perceptual capacities is some mechanism, which is a matter of some entities, right, some neurons, some, some white cells maybe, right, some, you know, blood and oxygen or the rest of it, uh, which are organized in such a way that they are responsible for the phenomenon. Either that they cause that phenomenon, right, they cause a response, which is, um, uh, you know, recognition of the table or the bottle, or that they underpin, that they constitute that capacity or that manifestation of a capacity to spot tables. So they can be etiological in the sense that they're giving a causal historical description or explanation for why a particular phenomenon occurs, or they can be constitutive. So a mechanistic explanation is an explanation which just identifies the mechanisms which underpin or cause the phenomenon that we're interested in. And this is a very natural way of thinking about explanation in general, and in particular in the neuroscientists, in the neurosciences. Okay, so I just thought I'd give you this example because it's a beautiful example in its own right. And it's also going to be interesting when we look later on at some different questions. So imagine your, your question is, is how we're able to navigate in the ways that we do. Okay, what, what explains our navigational behavior? So that's the phenomenon. And uh, you come up with this sort of high level, rather abstract understanding of how that navigational behavior is working, which is that you say that there's some cognitive representation of Euclidean space, which you then mark your position in, represent your position in, and then you can represent changes in that position. Um, and then there's this uh, more mechanistic explanation, right? this, this lower level 
um, more physical explanation, which is that um, our navigational behavior can be explained by the fact that our hippocampus has these wonderful grid cells and uh, that those cells are realizing a cognitive representation of Euclidean space. And when you do um, fMRI scans, you find these beautiful hippocampal grid cells, which look like they are almost physically <laughs> manifesting representations of Euclidean space. And when you knock these out, people can't navigate. And uh, it's, there's a beautiful, beautiful finding here. Okay, so this looks like a wonderful situation where we've got um, a phenomenon. We're interested in finding those aspects of the world which explain why that phenomenon is as it is, right? why our navigational abilities are as they are. And then we find the mechanism. We find that thing, that aspect of the world which is responsible for our navigational behavior, namely the activity of these hippocampal grid cells. And put all of that together and it looks like we've got this wonderful non-reductive interlevel mechanistic explanation for the phenomena that we're interested in and we're all incredibly positive and optimistic. One of the reasons why I'm showing you this particular um, study is because this was replicated in um, by the Google DeepMind team a couple of years ago and uh, they trained deep artificial neural networks um, to be good navigators and when they then analyzed their deep artificial neural networks they found these these um, uh, structures of node activation that looked almost identical to the hippocampal grid cell activity that underpins our own navigational behavior that is so beautiful okay so where have we got to We had this puzzle. What is it that deep artificial neural network designers cannot explain? Um, it looks like, on the face of it, they have complete knowledge of all of the mechanisms which underpin deep artificial neural network activity. And it also looks like, or at least it's plausible, right, when we look at examples like the one I've just shown you from neuroscientists, that providing those mechanisms, okay, identifying those mechanisms is enough to give you an explanation for this particular kind of phenomenon. So what is the puzzle? Well, the puzzle is going to be something like this. It's going to be something like, given that we have complete knowledge of all the mechanisms which secure artificial neural network outputs, why do we not have complete explanations? Or we might say, why don't mechanistic explanations work over deep artificial neural networks? Or another way of framing this would be to say, look, given all of the knowledge we do have of uh, mathematical structure and process and training and so on, why can we not find the mechanisms? That would be another way of putting the question. So, We've got our puzzle, but I think we've also, in the distinctions that I've made, got some sense of why this puzzle might be relatively easy to dissolve, okay? Or why it might be a sort of pseudo puzzle. So when we're thinking about opacity, right, there are various things that people mean, and it's good to just quickly chart what those are. And so we might just mean to be talking about commercial opacity, right? people keeping things secret, so that they keep their IP, so that um, they can make money. That's one form of opacity, which is nothing to do with genuinely being able to explain uh, the workings of a system. It's just not wanting to explain the workings of a system. And you know, this may well be, and I'm sure is, and will become ever more of a problem for regulators. But it's not the problem that I'm interested in. Right? This doesn't look like a genuine problem with being able to explain the mechanisms. It just looks like a problem of wanting to communicate that explanation to others. Again, we might have some kind of opacity which relates to um, our sense of a desire for subjective explanation, 
okay? So it might be that artificial neural network designers lack the ability to communicate what the mechanism is to people like me, um, or indeed to each other right, in ways that satisfy them. Um, and it might be that people like me just really don't have what it takes in terms of background knowledge um, to understand the explanations that we would be being offered. Genuine explanatory opacity in the sense that I'm interested in is opacity where there just really is no explanation or no explanation perhaps of a mechanistic kind of the aspect of the phenomenon which we wanted explaining. So it's useful to have those distinctions in mind whenever you're thinking about opacity. Um, and I think some, there's going to be some temptation here to say that it's going to be just these subjective elements or communicative or public elements or indeed commercial elements which are explaining the um, explanatory opacity in this particular case. And there's just sort of different evidence here. So I'm just, you know, doing a little bit of sociology of artificial neural network design here. So we've got people like Lynn in 2007 saying things like, many algorithms using artificial neural networks are understood only at a heuristic level. In other words, they're not really understood at all. They're just, uh, we've got helpful models that help us to predict which ones are gonna work. Okay, so it's not really an understanding. It's just where we empirically know that certain training protocols employing large data sets will result in excellent performance. So we just know that there's a particular kind of reliability profile, but we don't have any explanation for why the systems are as reliable as we know them to be. Here's um, uh, a lovely graph from Gunning and DARPA uh, a few years ago. So, chart on the left of all of the different machine learning techniques. Um, you'll see that neural nets and deep learning are on the left. Um, things like, you know, nice linear regression models, decision trees, ensemble methods, random forests, and so on are on the right. Um, and they argue in this paper that there is an inverse correlation between explainability and prediction accuracy. Okay, so they've got this lovely graph. Okay, the more accurate you are, the less explainable the system is. And with deep learning systems at the top of the accuracy pile and the bottom of the explainability pile. Now, of course, one interesting question, which isn't actually completely clear from this paper is how they measure, how they quantify explainability. Um, and, you know, I hope at least, you know, by giving the talk, if not by the content of what I've been saying, you'll be starting to question what it means to explain anything. I mean, what, what an explanation really is. Um, and so it's unclear how, how we're quantifying on the, on the right there. But still, I think this graph is fantastic. And I think many machine learning designers would agree, um, would just accept that this is the situation they find themselves in. At the same time, we have lots of uh, people writing as if it's just assumed that there is a particular kind of explanatory transparency um, where it comes to at least um, perception systems, which are deep artificial neural networks. So we've got Nguyen et al, 2015. This is not um, an uncommon way of talking. It comes from Hinton. Deep neural networks learn hierarchical layers of representation from sensory inputs in order to perform pattern recognition. Well, if that's not an explanation for how a system in general is um, recognizing patterns, and if that's not the kind of generic explanation that one should be able to dig down into for particular systems to provide a genuine mechanistic explanation for why a system is good at spotting traffic cones or whatever, then I don't know what is, right? So this looks like just an assumption that um, systems are genuinely transparent. And then the problem, the opacity would be communicative, subjective, um, much less interesting from a philosophical point of view, even if still concerning from a regulatory point of view. I mean, one thing that's interesting to note here is that even though there's often things are talked about as if deep artificial 
neural networks are in fact completely transparent. We don't find the transparency, it's not as if you look at uh, the code, you find these hierarchical layers of representation, okay? You find hierarchical layers just in the sense that you know that you put them in there. Um, and then when you look at, as it were, the contents of those layers, you don't find any representations um, at all, except of the layer before. And so you certainly don't find um, more and more uh, abstract kinds of representation of, of the kind that's being invoked here. Right. What we're doing, if we're talking about hierarchical layers of ever more abstract representation in deep artificial neural networks, is actually employing exactly the kind of um, hands-off neuroscientific methodology that you would if you were trying to understand um, a system rather than using a system to try and understand other things. So that's just a note uh, and aside because hopefully we'll come back later. So what I want to do now is just to, is just to try and argue that there, there really is good reason to think that there's this more interesting kind of explanatory opacity um, that we're just not finding the mechanisms. It's not just that we can't talk about them very well or that people like me can't understand them. It's just that we're not finding explanatory mechanisms um, that answer the questions we wanted to ask about deep artificial neural networks. So here are some concerns. They go from sort of more abstract to, to more empirical. Uh, the most abstract one is just, it's just that there is a failure of mapping and indeed it's the failure of mapping that explains why we um, employ artificial neural networks in the first place. Um, another sort of slightly less abstract problem is what I'm going to call the information problem following DeWitt and then there's a nice uh, example of how difficult it's going to be to really be satisfied that we've found explanatory mechanisms where it comes to um, really good, robust, deep artificial neural networks. Okay, so more abstract. Why, why do we turn to artificial neural networks? It's precisely because it's precisely in those situations where we don't have any map, we don't have any reductive explanations of how high level properties like being a cat relates to the low level properties which stimulate us. Distal properties like fluffy faces and pointy ears, which of course lots of other things have, as well as cats. Um, or even worse, proximal stimuli, so just the, the actual um, stimulation of, of your retinal cones or uh, the direct proximal inputs to artificial neural networks. Okay, so suppose the aim is to come up with some animal recognition engine, okay, we want a system that's going to spot whether something is an animal and then it's going to tell us what that animal is and then we think about this cat and we go well look you know it's great it's got pointy ears, it's got those round eyes, it's got those little teeth, okay but then you then you think about all of these other pictures and you think well frankly you know if you're just thinking about the bitmap here right if you're thinking about the um, the spread of pixels, the proximal input to the system, uh, you are going to really struggle to understand how we can think that these are all cats. Okay, they've got different shaped eyes, they've got different colored fur. There are different things that you can see. You can see a tongue in one, you can see teeth in another. Uh, you've got round eyes in one um, and so on. So, you know, if you think of it, they all look like cats to us, it's very, very hard for you to concentrate on the bitmap, but be painterly, try and imagine what you'd need to do to paint it, and it just looks like there's nothing that these things have in common. Um, and so we don't know how that proximal input maps to being recognizably a cat. That's why we use artificial neural networks. If we had the answer to that question, we might have a mechanism, but, or, uh, something which would be parallel to a mechanism but we don't which is why we're using them okay so there's no obvious neat mapping of low level features in our environment to 
the high level features that we're interested in. And there's certainly no obvious mapping between um, proximal stimuli, right? bitmaps, inputs, retinal stimulation, and even low level features like fluffiness, let alone high level features like being a cat. Okay, so it's just not obvious why we would expect a simple hierarchical feature mapping system to be able to explain high level output. We might start with the, the bitmaps of these. It's very, very unclear why we would expect methodologically there to be some nice neat linear move up from the bitmaps to ever more abstract representations that would lead us in these cases to cats and not in other cases. Okay. So that's just the sort of general problem, right? Which also explains why we want these machines. Um, here's a more specific way of, of putting the difficulty of, of finding the mechanism, even when we know all of the maths and all of the history of our artificial neural networks. We can think of there as being particular information running through the system. And we can think to ourselves that there must be sufficient information for the system to be able to um, extract catness from the bitmaps that it receives. But what it's very difficult to do is to pull apart um, what you might call system as receiver information, right? So thinking of this system as a contained system in its own right, which is eventually outputting a representation of catness, an experimenter as receiver information. So where we are thinking of the information that we might model the system as representing for our own experimenter purposes. So the worry is that when you actually look at the mathematical processes, you don't find on the face of it, you know, contrast classical computation, you don't find any representations that are going to help you to understand mechanism and it's very hard to know uh, or it's very hard to feel assured that you can model those accurately for instance areas of the system which are not firing on a particular occasion right the, their failure to fire is just as much a causal influence on the layer above as would their firing be okay it's just as much of an influence as to how uh, the uh, the nodes will, the nodes in the layer above will fire, that a particular area is not firing. So there's a question about where, what kind of information there is and where it is and how we would map it. Right? Is a failure to fire um, going to be considered to be um, a part of the information flow through the system? If so, how's that going to relate to particular representations? Okay, so um, I'll leave that there. I'm happy to answer it more. I'm aware that I've been talking for quite a long time. Uh, okay, so my, my third and final and most specific uh, case for the prosecution um, is uh, a wonderful finding also from Google DeepMind about node selectivity. So what are we trying to do? Who is the opponent that I'm imagining here? The opponent is someone who thinks, look, Yes, we have all of this complete, complete knowledge. And in fact, when we look very carefully at that complete knowledge, we can find mechanisms which explain how the system works. Um, so here's a beautiful finding from the DeepMind team. So they found an inverse correlation between the selectivity of the nodes, so how specific the nodes are in their firing, and how well the artificial neural networks generalized, in other words, how, how well they performed, um, how well they took their reliability from their training set to the real world. So a node is going to count as being selective of some feature like being a cat or being fluffy or whatever, if it tends to fire when and only when there's fluffiness or when there are cats. And a network generalizes if it reliably outputs correctly in response to novel inputs, in other words, inputs that it hasn't been trained on. And the finding for more personnel was that networks which are intuitively um, more mappable, right, intuitively have these nodes which are more selective, more easy to think of as being 
representations as part of a mechanism delivering your output, they're going to, they just turn out to be less good as artificial neural networks than networks in which particular nodes are less selective, in other words, where it's much harder to think of yourself as accurately modeling um, interesting representations into the system, explanatory representations into the system. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna cut that. So this is just thinking, look, you know, people have made these attempts. Um, I am suspicious of these attempts. I, I think the one thing I'll say is that as soon as you're in the business of attempting to, to generate, to overcome the problem of explanatory opacity, right? You've already admitted that there's a genuine puzzle because you've admitted that in spite of your complete knowledge or access to complete knowledge of the system, you still don't have an explanation within that knowledge for why the system works as it does. Okay, so that's all I'll say for that from now. Where does this leave us? Well, what I want to say is that this leaves us with some good reason for genuine negativity, okay? Genuine sense that there really is explanatory opacity. Um, many of these artificial neural networks do just seem to display a certain explanatory opacity. And of course, the puzzle in the background is that we have complete knowledge of the mathematical mechanisms which implement artificial neural network behavior, in other words, present us with the outputs that we're presented with. What I want to say is that those, that knowledge does actually explain some really interesting things. It just doesn't explain what we're interested in, especially if we're thinking about regulation, um, about uh, oversight and about um, public trust. Uh, so we're left with this sense that our knowledge doesn't provide us with an explanation of how artificial neural networks work. And what do we lack? Well, what we need to reflect on, as I've just mentioned, is the explanatory context, right? What it was that we actually wanted to explain in the first place. Okay, what we wanted was explanations that would feed into our understanding of how to optimize right, as researchers how to optimize these systems or generalize from them um, or you know take good practice and put it into new contexts or um, as regulators right for forensic analysis we wanted to be able to provide explanations for why particular things happened on particular occasions that would satisfy us um, and for regulation more generally and public trust right. so that's the background and that gives us a clue as to what the thing that we wanted explaining was. Okay. What we wanted explaining was not the particular output, right? but in cases where we're forensically analyzing a particular output, why the output was this way on this particular occasion, how that fitted into a more general picture of how the system produces its outputs, right? what outputs the system produces, or for regulation and trust, we're interested in the reliability more generally of the system. So we want to know that, we want to know why the system is reliable, okay? So why give it some new input, right? It will still provide you with the right result. And of course, we also would love to be able to predict the outputs, right? Give it a cat, it'd be lovely to predict that it could always tell you that what it had was a cat. Okay, so what I want now to do is just to, just to clarify again some distinctions that I think are really important. So what we should be distinguishing are explanations of token phenomena. We also want to distinguish ex between those and explanations of phenomena type identified by proximal input. Okay, so artificial neural networks are deterministic so whenever you provide them with exactly the same stimuli, you'll get exactly the same result, unless they're still being trained, right? So at any point in their um, training, provide them with exactly the same input, they'll provide you with exactly the same output. So now we can explain why there are particular types of output on the basis that there are particular types of 
inputs, namely the same bitmaps being pushed into the system. But what we wanted right, was an explanation of the reliability phenomena that we have. Okay, we want to be able to say things like over both training and testing data, X reliably outputs a particular output given distal stimuli of type C, in other words, stimuli out there in the world like cats and so on. Okay, what we wanted to do was to be able to explain why that was, right? Why we've got that reliability profile that we know that we've got. So I suggest that we actually have mechanistic explanations for both the first two questions. Okay, if you want to know why the system outputted, you know, this particular um, uh, uh, spread of array of outputs in its in its top layer, right? You've got everything you need to answer that question. <laughs> you've got all of the maths. Uh, you've got all the processes. You can talk about the training sets. You can talk about the weighting of the nodes. There is nothing that you can't say about why the top layer is as the top layer is. Likewise, there's nothing you can't say about why the top layer is as it is, the output layer, um, given a particular input. Right? You, you give it that input, you know the weightings, you know the relations between the different nodes, you know what the output is going to be, and you can explain by pointing to those mechanisms, those mathematical structures, you can satisfactorily explain why the output kind is as it is, right? why whenever you have that input, you have this output. But what that doesn't do specifically is give you what that doesn't add up to, right? and this is, this is the interesting thing for me, what that doesn't add up to is an explanation of why the system is reliable. Okay, this is the question of why a system is reliable is really the question of why it's any good, right? There's something normative about this, okay? You know, we're interested in um, why a system is uh, over huge numbers of different kinds of inputs, robustly able to provide you with the right results and not give you any false positives. So as stakeholders, as regulators and so on, right, we are interested in the questions of why systems are reliable or what grounds their reliability. Okay, and I just want, to, want you to note that that's not the same as being able to describe the reliability profile of an artificial neural network, okay? You can ask when is a neural network reliable or you can ask what is the shape or the profile of that reliability in what kinds of domains, over what kinds of domains, right? within which kinds of parameters is this system reliable. And indeed you can get um, answers for those, right, just by doing lots of testing um, and trying things out. But notice that the second one is just an empirical generalization. Right? You're, just, you're just saying with good reason that the system does have a particular profile of reliability. What you haven't given us, why we feel unsatisfied, right, is not, not just because um, we don't understand the maths, okay, although we don't, I don't, uh, it's that what we haven't been provided with is, is a normative explanation for why that empirical generalization is true, okay? Uh, we've discovered that the system is reliable within certain parameters, we're happy with that, but we just don't understand why. And looking at the system, this is what's so odd, does not deliver us a mechanism. We don't find the kinds of representations or the structures of representations or processes over representations, which would allow us to understand why the reliability profile is like this. So there's some good news here, right? Which is that, look, we can just be honest about this and say that we've got all of the tools that we need to give well-justified empirical generalizations about the reliability profiles of artificial neural networks, like what, within what parameters they're good, um, you know, what you do to, what it would take to mess them up, um, what kinds of um, uh, uh, what kinds of stimuli they would 
go wrong with. Um, and then, you know, as long as uh, those parameters are parameters that we're happy to accept and that we're happy to leave the system running within, um, we've got an awful lot of confidence. We can, can have an awful lot of confidence in what the system is doing. The danger, I think, one of the dangers is um, uh, not recognizing or not being sort of honest with ourselves enough about the difference between just providing that reliability profile and um, giving a genuine explanation of the mechanisms which underpin um, kinds of outputs, namely, you know, the cat output just when there are cats. Okay. So I know I'm running low on time. Okay, just think of a bridge designer. Here are three different things you could do. Um, you give a narrative explanation for why you think this bridge is going to stay up. Right? That's what we have with artificial neural networks. You can give a precedent explanation. And it's, these aren't explanations of why it will stand up. They're explanations of why we should be confident that they will stand up. Right? Precedent explanation, other bridges have done well. And in the case of bridges, we also have a normative explanation because we've got the mechanisms, the laws of physics, the natures of the materials employed and the way they're put together, which shows us why the system is reliable. Okay, so where have we got to? I suggest that artificial neural network designers have complete token mechanistic explanations, right? They have, they have them, as it were, the mechanism which explains every specific output, every individual output, every event of outputting that the system deploys. Because that's just the maths. These are deterministic. We know it's not magic. Okay, and we shouldn't be ashamed to say that these, those are explanations for um, the particular outputs. Um, they're objectively satisfactory explanations for the particular outputs that we find. Um, we can generalize those, but only when we've got sameness of proximal inputs. Um, and we can also give justified empirical generalizations as to the shape of the reliability of our systems. So what we're lacking is this. What we're lacking are normative explanations of the grounds of that reliability. In other words, why the system has that reliability shape. Why are we lacking them? Because we can't find um, enough internal structure for example, representational structure, which is why I went through those questions about representations. We just can't find that kind of structure. In other words, we can't find uh, the bits and pieces that the system is um, composed out of in such a way that we can understand why the system keeps working in the way that it does. So that's what grounds negativity. In other words, we've got good reasons for negativity. It's not just a sense. It's not just the phenomenology of a lack of satisfaction with an explanation. There's a genuine reason, I think, out there in the world why um, we should be negative. There's another question, which is whether we should be pessimistic. So just from the fact that we don't currently have the right mechanistic explanations, um, it doesn't follow that we won't have. Um, Romans only had precedent and uh, um, other forms of justification for their bridge building practices. Okay, but we now have physics and physics is great and tells us what the mechanisms are, you know, along with all of our abilities to analyze materials and so on, tells us what the mechanisms are that allow bridges to stay up. Um, so don't worry. I think we just need to be very honest and be happy to be honest. Uh, and hopefully some of these distinctions will, will make it easier for artificial neural networks designers to, to explain what they can and can't say about their systems and um, uh, why there's still an awful lot of good reason to implement these. Should we be pessimistic? I think we should, but perhaps I should leave that for another time, given that I've already run over. Okay. I've run over hugely, actually. Apologies. Thank you.